get the little recording button. Oh yeah, that's done. Yeah. Uh, so here's the link to the book. Uh, oh, yeah, this has a. You can Facebook pop that in thing. at the end or now or. or yeah, okay. I'll put it in. I'll do both. So. Okay. That and. Uh, here we go. This is a description of the book. Okay. This is the book, uh, TOEFL IBT Express. A sample description, brief. You can skip, skip all that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be digging into it. <laughs> Great. Okay. So there's no need. Um, no need. Uh, so we just, uh, Dorothy, if you just want to start off. Uh, introduce Express Publishing and uh, take it away. Okay. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen again. So one thing that I don't like about um, webinars, summits, et cetera, et cetera, is when there is hidden advertising. So I'm going to tell you that the advertising in this is not hidden. It's going to be right up front. I'm going to be talking to you about this book <laughs> that was published most recently by Express Publishing. I We actually first wrote this for um, Pearson Education um, be before the, the 2019 TOEFL changes, and we moved it over to Express because they were willing to do a revision for the, the new test, and have been very happy. The reason I get to talk about this book is because Express Publishing is, thank you very much, one of the sponsors of this two-day summit of bringing in all the speakers and organizing it and everything. And in exchange for them giving financial support to the summit, they get to talk about their book. And because I wrote the book, <laughs> I get to talk about the book and what's in it. So I wanted to talk about what to do with teaching TOEFL besides just taking practice tests. I think often when students are, are study on their own, not with a teacher, the only thing they know how to do is to take a lot of practice tests. And then of course their score doesn't really change much beyond statistical variation. So I'm gonna be giving you, of course, examples from this book because that's the point of this talk. But the same criteria that I'm talking about, you could use to evaluate any book. My book is one TOEFL book. There are plenty of other TOEFL books out there and there are plenty of other good TOEFL books out there. So if, there's, if you're trying to choose between different materials or evaluate the materials you have, I wanna give you just some things to think about. Does this book offer this? Does it do that? And I'm not saying this book is the only choice out there. Or if you want to create all your own materials, make sure you're doing this, that, and the, the other things. So I'd like it to be a bit more broad than, than just this book. To create this book took me and a very experienced TOEFL co-author, um, Tammy Gilbert. I think it originally took us 18 months and then another six months when we revised it for the 2019 test. So for me, the reason that a teacher would use a book at all is because you don't want to spend 18 months writing TOEFL material. If you've been teaching for 20 years or 10 years, you might have 18 months of material already under your belt and you just need to organize it. So practice tests are not entirely Bad. I don't mean that your students should never take practice tests. So, I mean, some of the good things about taking practice tests is it helps students on test day be less nervous because they know what's coming. Uh, I noticed this when I renewed my driver's license, which in the United States is now on a, a, on a computer screen. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there were other people in the room who are better drivers than I am but I was a good test taker. I was not afraid to see test questions online. I could instantly understand if we could go back and do things again, or if we were just moving forward. And I could see other people who were probably fine in a car, just nervous taking a test online. 
So giving your students practice tests, especially if you can do it in IBT-like conditions, will help them relax on, on test days. They also don't have to sort of waste their mental energy on directions. At the time they take the test, they should know those direction lines cold. There should be no surprises there in question types or, or, or task types. As they take a number of sort of quote unquote real tests, they will know what they're what's challenging for them and, and what they're good at. So it's a way, way to help them diagnose where they need to, to study. And if they're doing more than one practice test, especially spaced out, if you can, with, with some weeks or months, they can see themselves getting better, I hope. And we, uh, if, you, if you came to my talk on, on writing, you might remember that I said the nice thing about TOEFL students is they, they turn up motivated, right? You don't have to worry about them sort of cheating on tests or something because they know that <laughs> they need an accurate understanding of their own progress. So taking a practice test every now and then or a portion of a practice test gives them motivation. So what should you have in a collection of TOEFL material? I think at a minimum, you should have one or more complete tests, whether it's in your book or online, you should have complete tests of, of the reading, the listening, the speaking, and the writing. All of the item types you should have examples of. Now, the actual direction lines, word for word off a TOEFL test, those are copyrighted. So what you see in books is going to be a paraphrase of the exact directions that they get on the TOEFL. I know many of the exact directions on the TOEFL because when I took, I hope the ETS people aren't listening to this. When I took the test myself, um, I took a pen and a white bra and I went into the bathroom at break time and I wrote down some of the direction lines inside my bra just, just for understanding <laughs> the test and how it works. But we as, as, as TOEFL writers are not allowed to exactly copy ETS's wording because that is copyrighted to them. So you'll, but you should get an item type that looks very, very similar and directions that look very, very similar. I think it's really important to have a good answer key section. In some non-TOEFL textbooks, there, there's often a discussion of, should we have answers in the book? Or are our students gonna check the answers and cheat that way? TOEFL students aren't gonna do that. But after they do an exercise, I think it's really important for them to be able to understand why this answer is right and why these other answers are wrong. And that can be, I mean, the TOEFL is, is an academic test. It's hard for teachers too. So it's nice to, to have all of that written out for you and to not have to try to come up with answers on the spot. So those are test taking things. But for language things, I think you need to, to have a book that breaks down for you, what are the skills you need in order to answer this type of question? Okay, we know there's an inference question. We know this is a details question. We know this is a main idea question. What skills do you need in order to answer that kind of question? And then some micro work on those skills. So this book that, that we wrote is, every section is broken down into skills. And you practice two skills at a time, first separately and then together. And then you have like sort of like little review sections as you go along so that you're constantly practicing skills. And I'll show you some examples of these from, from each section. I think you need to do, have something that you can do in class besides just taking a test. Um, I, like, I like a lot of pair work and, and group work. So we have that in there. If you have a, a private student, you would just be, be their partner where they can go through something, break it down, discuss, share answers, exchange papers, uh, discuss why something is right or wrong, something for them to actually do in class that looks a bit more like a traditional um, class. I, I, I don't want everybody sitting alone taking a test and then just getting their, their scores. I want them to be interacting somehow. We talked in my previous session about how 
TOEFL throws a ton of topics at you. So you want your book to also have a ton of different topics. And it's 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 hard as a writer because I mean there there are there are subjects I just love more than than other subjects, and it's very tempting to want to write about the things that you love. So my co-author and I kept this huge spreadsheet, and every time we we came up with a topic for a full test for a one paragraph exercise, uh, we went through the spreadsheet and made sure we were getting a balance of different kinds of academic topics. And I'm going to show you a. a an example of some of the things that we that we pulled. And I do think you need tips and advice for students on how they can work on reading and listening and speaking and writing outside of class as well as inside class. Unless you unless your class meets 30 hours a week, they're going to need to do some of the work on their own outside of class. So this this is just a, a, a sort of random selection of of I, I just sort of before this presentation I skimmed through the book and picked out topics here and there. Um, we have music, we have biology, we have business, we have math, we have literature, we have um, science, and they need to constantly be seeing different topics, different topics, different topics, even in those like little kind of one paragraph examples. Um, so they begin to get over some of that fear of, oh my goodness, I don't know anything about this. There are also in the listening, what we call service encounters. Um, so half of the listenings are, are, are topics, right? They're, they're lectures, but the other half are, are service encounters of students going to the registrar or a student going to an advisor's office. For those, I actually took a notebook and a pencil. I didn't record anybody. That that felt possibly not legal. Um, but I did take a pen and a notebook and I wandered around our university going into offices. I'm, I don't teach there anymore, but nobody questioned my presence. And I just listened. What are students saying to people at desks? What are they saying to each other? And I kind of hung out in the Starbucks in the, the student center and listened to students and study groups and, and took notes. So I hope that our service counters are also authentic. I do have some friends who work in university administration, someone in the international office, uh, a registrar. So I sent some of the conversations through and to, to them as documents and said, is this the kind of encounter you would have with a student? And she said, oh, we'd say this. And Oh, another common question. Students come in and they need to reset their password for their, their university email account. And here's all the identification we need to ask from them before they can reset their password. So I have a conversation in, in the book on resetting a, a password. So I'm going to go kind of through the four sections, but in, in, in the order that they're in the book, but we'll, we'll get briefer and briefer because every section has sort of some of the same features and you only need to, to see them once. So certainly in every section, there's a, a skill. In this case, understanding vocabulary from context and an explanation of what that looks like on the test, right? So what the skill is, what it means, and then how does that show up on the test? The phrase on the clock is closest in meaning to, and you know, and you have that 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 highlighted section. So the, they certainly need a, a, a clear explanation of what's going on. Then we have scattered throughout the book, I think almost a hundred tips um, that are divided by skill in to how you actually do this. I mean, it, if you say, oh, you should just get your vocabulary from context, it's like, okay, but but what context, how does that work? So we can say, well, a specific context clue that, that the IBT uses a lot is that contrast clue, where they've put a word in there that you don't know, diurnal, but your definition is kind of hidden in the text as a contrast. Rats are active at night. The mongoose, on the other hand, there's our contrast, is diurnal. So you don't know what diurnal means, but you know it's on the other hand, so it's got to be the opposite of active at night. Got to be the opposite of nocturnal. It's active during the day. So the words that TOEFL is testing you on, they assume you don't know. But they wouldn't be testing you on that if they hadn't 
created clues in the passage to give you the answer. And another tip, after you have selected an answer, see if it will fit into the sentence and make sense. You must wear your uniform as long as you are on the clock. If you think it means at work, you must wear your uniform as long as you are at work. Yes, that makes sense. It fits. So go back and put your answer into the, into the sentence. So like I said, throughout the book, in every section, we've got these tips on what to do. So here's an example of what I mean by working on a skill. So this is working on, I think it's a skill five, five or six, um, on rhetorical purposes and, and function questions. Why does the author say X? So they have a passage. And in one passage of, of say, 550, 600 words, you would get one of these questions, right? What does the author mean when he says X? But if I want them to specifically practice on that, I would give them more work to do. So we have four questions to match to. I don't like matchings that go four to four, right? Because then by the time they get to the fourth one, they're not thinking anymore. So I always do uneven numbers of matching. So we have four purposes, more than you would get in one actual TOEFL section. But I want them to have some intensive practice of thinking, why is this mentioned? What is this doing? What is this doing? The listening also has a breakdown of skills. It also has tips. It also has, has activities to do in class. But we then to list, listening, we add note-taking skills because those are so hugely important. And there's pages and pages of note-taking skills and examples of what notes would look like. Uh, this is an example of, of an indent system of, of just writing a bit more to the right to show subpoints. So you have main ideas on the left, subpoints are getting indented. We talk about abbreviations and things that you could drop, and then what that would look like in note form. And that that's a very individual thing. Some students actually write faster, writing out a complete word than it would take them to think of an abbreviation. So for some students, abbreviations are so, so useful and they write faster that way. Some students will get panicked over, how do I abbreviate this? And it would actually be faster for them to write the whole word. So I don't, I don't want students to think there's just one way to take notes. It's like, if it works for you, it works. But they need a lot of practice note-taking because they have to find something that's gonna work for them. So here's an example in listening of, of breaking down a skill and working on it. Our skill is understanding the speaker's stance, like what is their, you know, their feeling, their mood, their opinion. So we have some examples of what a stance could be, agreeing, uh, enjoying, are you bored, worried, they like something, they don't like something, some examples of questions, which of the best following best expresses the speaker's attitude towards X then to, to break down that skill before they listen for it, we have a whole dialogue printed. So the directions are to work with a partner and read the dialogue. So they have, they have a picture as, as the listening sets you up for in the TOEFL. They read the dialogue with a partner and then go through these questions that will sort of unpack what are people feeling and how do you know that? So how does Mike Megan's tutor respond when she shows up? What does he say that reveals what he is feeling? So I want them to, you know, or question four, what is Mike's attitude about Megan's first draft? What does he say to her about it? So how do we, how do we know that that's his feeling? Or number five, does Mike agree or disagree with Professor Spencer's recommendation? What phrase tells you he agreed or disagreed? So to get them to begin to analyze in a conversation, where, where are those clues? Then they actually do the listening and answer the questions so they can hear what these sound like. But I want them to do some non, you know, completely TOEFL-like practice first so they can work on getting better on those skills. And 
the, the one thing I really like about the TOEFL is that they don't ever use tone of voice deceptively. If somebody sounds angry, they're angry. If somebody sounds bored, they're bored. If somebody sounds confused, they're confused. So absolutely, the voice actors on the, the TOEFL use tone of voice to express feelings. And it's never going to be something that, that, that's tricking you into thinking that they think something they don't. So that's why I say, even if you listen to, to commercials on YouTube or, or television shows, you'd be getting so much practice with tone of voice showing feelings. As we move on to the speaking, we still have skills and classroom activities and tips and all of that broken down and note-taking practice. <laughs> so, but we've added, so examples of what responses would look like and what scores they would get and why they would get those scores. We've also added for the speaking and the writing some self-evaluation, especially if you have students working at home or working independently or, or even working in groups when they, after they do a speaking exercise, sort of how do you, how do you get feedback for, about that in, in a vacuum? So we want them to record themselves if they can. If they have to do it by memory, th then they have to. But almost every phone these days has a, has a recording function. So if they could record themselves, play it back and begin to evaluate themselves. How confident did you feel about these things? Did you answer the question? Did you speak fluently? Did you use appropriate expressions for stating your opinion, preference, and choice? And those would have been taught in the unit. What is something you did well? What do you want? What, what needs improvement? And I love that last question because I wrote it. How do you plan to improve those things? So if you have some kind of weakness, what, what can you do? And sometimes it's, you know, learn more of these phrases. Often what students write there is, is practice. I mean, they, they know that practice will help them. So all of the skills will have a little task, but then also a self-evaluation that goes with the task. For the writing, we have all of that other stuff, including self-evaluations. The writing section also has self-evaluations. So students can go back and look at what they wrote and think, oh, did I, did I get the lecturer's reaction to the reading? Did I have this? But you'll know if you listen to me talking about the writing that I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in outlines <laughs> and giving students practice with outlines. So this is actually a, a, a breakdown of a comparison. This is the integrated task where the, the lecturer and the lecture and the reading are both talking about the topic of Thomas Edison and the light bulb. So there's a reading, but I want them to actually take notes in outline form. So I give them the outline so they have some sort of guidance to how to, to write that outline. Then they listen to the lecture and take notes. Sorry about that line in the middle. These are just on, on different pages. I couldn't put that neatly on a slide. So then they listen to the lecture, take notes, work with a partner, compare your lecture notes and your reading notes. Then complete the outline for a written response. And here I've, I've given them the outline. So we have the introduction, Edison's importance. Then we have Davies light bulb, other inventors, point for the reading, lecturer's response, point for the reading, lecturer's response, point for the reading, lecturer's response. In that case, they all had the same points. There, you weren't matching three and two, but we have the reading and the lecture going beyond or disagreeing. So I've given them the outline. Then we do, I show them some sample answers of, of what it should look like. We tried to give, I think we did give sample answers everywhere, even for things that don't have one answer. So this is a sort of a, a suggested answer. They could word it slightly differently, but this is the information that needs to be there. So even when we had notes and we asked students to take notes, and of course everybody's notes are going to look different, but we put sample notes of what good notes could look like. And I think it's important for students to see that kind of example too. 
we spent, oh gosh, so much time on the answer section of the TOEFL. So there's answers to all the skill builders. What, what is a possible outline? What does a sample essay look like? What do sample notes look like? And then for the more test-like questions, that's about the length of the answer. This is from the reading section. Oh uh, yeah, um, the difference, compare and contrast between harpsichords and pianos is our is our topic. So we start always with what answer is correct and why with quotations from the reading passage and what answers are incorrect and why. Every incorrect answer is, is supposed to sort of tempt the student in a way. So if they've been tempted by an incorrect answer, they need to know why that was leading them astray. So I absolutely, I would use answer keys in class. You could elicit ideas from students first and say, why do you think B is incorrect? But if your class doesn't know, you wanna have a source that tells you why B is incorrect. So this is an example of um, a writing score, a, a, a writing response, and we have one at a, a different band. So they have the same prompt, but different different answers, one that would score two, one that would score, I think we did two, three, four, and five. So, so they can see what kind of answer gets what kind of score. And then there's an explanation as to why. Why is this score a three? Why is it not lower? Why is it not higher? And again, that just helps them know what they're working towards because that's what, you know, they'll know what TOEFL wants. Every section has a whole list of tips for them to improve uh, reading and speaking and listening and writing outside of class. So this, this isn't the whole list because it went on to, to two pages, but it's an example of the kinds of things they could do on the writing section. Some of them I went over in, in my, my previous talk. There's some extra ones there. Uh, as you can see, right where we run out of space there, it's getting into how can you work on your typing. But whether they're in an English speaking country or a non-English speaking country or in a class or taking uh, private lessons or working online, they will need ideas and tips and motivation to work on all their skills outside of class. You, you, you can't do it all as, as one teacher. So that's the book. I think Phil was going to neatly pop that link into the, the chat if you want it. Already there. Yeah. If, you, if you're watching this later or you can't copy or paste or that looks too long, you could also just remember Express Publishing and you could just search for it that way. It's Express Publishing, and by some happy coincidence, that was also the title of the book. That's how we knew Express was going to be the best publisher for this, because it's called TOEFL Express. So TOEFL Express from Express Publishing, um, updated for the 2019 test changes. We hope everything's in there. We hope it will help your students. We hope it'll help you, the teacher, <laughs> focus on teaching and not have to bring in this enormous bank of materials. And thank you for listening. Oh, um, and I sh oh, I should say, I should say, I'm, I'm not really good at marketing presentations. It is, it is a paper book. It is also a digital book. So the entire thing is also up on the Express digital platform. And we redid some of the exercises so that they can be done online. So all, all the recordings are up there on, on the website. And the, the audio for the book is free. So if you buy the book, you have access to the audio. It is not sold separately. It is included, which I, I think is in the old days, like 10, 15 years ago, you'd buy a TOEFL book and then turn around and the audio would be $60 and you'd be like, oh my God. But 